How's it going, people, people out in the world? Um, so, I'm gonna go ahead and make a long overdue video, and I, and honestly, like, I've made this video, like, numerous times. <laughs> Hopefully this one makes it <laughs> to YouTube, but, um, I wanna go ahead and, and make a video explaining why I am no longer a Jehovah's Witness. Um, you know, it's interesting, if you were raised a Jehovah's Witness and then you leave the organization, uh, there's this sense of shame. They try to shame you. And that shame causes a lot of people to not really want to speak about their experiences. But I think it's so important that we, as human beings, okay, as human beings, share our experiences with one another. Because when we don't share our experiences, what ends up happening is, these, these, these organizations, okay, these Goliaths of the world, okay, they, it, it, we're not shedding light on the truth about them, okay? And what ends up happening is us, the Davids out here, we end up getting beat up on, or at least the Goliath is trying to beat up on us, okay? Because we don't stand up to the Goliaths out here, okay? So it's important, I believe it's highly important for every one of us to, to share our stories so that people who are studying with these people, people who are in this religion, uh, people who just might be curious, you know what I'm saying? They have an idea of what to expect, of what it is, and of different people's experiences with this religion because perhaps, maybe, and just perhaps, you have had a similar experience or you know someone who has had a similar experience. All right, so with no further ado, let's get right into it. So basically, I was a third generation Jehovah's Witness. Um, my grandmother was Jehovah's Witness. My mother was a Jehovah's Witness. My grandmother, of course, had 13 children. And the great majority of them, although they are all believers in God, um, the great majority of them did not become Jehovah's Witnesses. There was only my mother and one other aunt of, of mine who actually took, uh, became a dedicated and baptized Jehovah's Witness, okay? Um, and my mother, she ended up marrying my father, who was not a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and he wasn't like the most religious guy, but he definitely believed in God. And I definitely can say that I'm forever grateful to God for his presence in my life because he grounded me in reality, okay? Because um, it's like there's a lot of religion being taught in this world, but not enough God being taught but that's a whole nother conversation okay so um but anyways my parents they split they were divorced and i was raised primarily by my mother okay and my grandmother but i would definitely spend time with my dad but what i'm saying is that he was not a he was a big influence on my life but i didn't live with him okay so i don't want people to think oh well this man is the reason why this and that like no okay we all have our stories but it was my choice to become a jehovah's witness it wasn't because of the influence of other people so anyways living with my mom we would you know, go to the meetings, squad and field service. I was that eight, nine year old kid knocking at your door, opening up the Bible to show you John 3, 16. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Like I enjoyed the educational process of becoming a believer in God, of, of becoming a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I've always been a knowledge junkie. You know what I mean? Particularly when it comes to the Bible. I remember some of my earliest memories in life um, are moments of trying to find God, moments of trying to understand who God was and thinking about God and, and just having this inward, this inner feeling of connection with God. Um, I remember that from the very, even before, this is long before I ever stepped foot in the Kingdom Hall. I remember these moments, you know, vividly and clearly. And so, and maybe it was because of the environment I grew up in, you know, like being around my grandmother and my, my parents, just the love that we felt and the way that we would pray, just the vibe of, of my family was just very, uh, I can't explain it, spiritual, okay? Uh, so that was my upbringing. And of course, when I was in high school, um, played sports, um, was never an issue. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses never made an issue of it. Um, but of course, with sports and a lack of discipline, I guess you would say, at the house came my ego and, um, I kind of fell away from the truth a little bit, dealing with girls and you know stuff like that, normal stuff that you know uh, young men deal with. And um, 
I ended up, this was before I was baptized, I was just studying at the time, and I had kind of slipped away, but then later on in the future, I got back involved, and I, got, I started taking it serious, and at this time, I was probably about 21 years old, um, and I started going hardcore back into the meetings, into service, I was giving talks, giving prayers, things of that nature, growing, 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 and then eventually, uh, I got baptized, and my baptism, to me, represented my dedication to God. It was, it had, to me, it had absolutely nothing to do with joining any organization. I baptized, I was agreed to get baptized because I told myself, Lord, my life is yours and I don't want to live my way. I want to give it all to you. Okay, so I was baptized. Um, so shortly thereafter, I would say maybe about six months later, um, well, immediately after I was baptized, everything in life became more important. Okay, I became highly, um, highly uh, inquisitive. I wanted answers to a lot of things, and I started to study much deeper into the Bible, and I started to have a much deeper understanding of certain things simply because I was putting in the effort. I think that God blessed me with a gift, okay? And I always had it, but I wasn't using it. And so when I started applying myself and using the gift that God had given me, like I started to understand so many more things. And like, you know, they talk about the deeper things of the truth or the deeper things of the Bible. Like those things I started to kind of, I started to grasp and I started to understand the Bible like this big puzzle. And I started to see all the pieces coming together to where I could see the grand picture, okay? Um, and because I believe what Jesus said, that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. Because I had a small child that I was raising, everything that I was teaching that child and what I was allowing to be a part of my worship became important. So uh, what kind of got me started down this route of where I am now um, was a concern that I had um, with the Jehovah's Witnesses literature. And the concern that I had was a matter of fact versus opinion okay so let's talk facts okay facts so the fact of the matter is and let me start this out by saying this I don't care what color Lazarus was Jesus was the Israelites were I don't care about the color of their skin okay it's not significant but what is significant is the truth what is reality is history and the racism that has existed in the United States of America since its inception is real. Okay, this is real. This is not something that I'm making up. This is real. Okay. And so what got what, what the first thing that kind of had me like a little skeptical was it seemed as though the society was. Uh, intentionally leaving out people of color or peoples of color from their depictions of Bible characters. Let me explain what I mean, okay? The Bible tells you that the children of Israel, okay, well, first of all, the Bible says that the ancient Egyptians, the who? The ancient Egyptians, okay? The ancient pharaohs who were around at the time of Moses, that these were the children of Ham. Ham is the progenitor of the dark-skinned races, the native African peoples, okay? Meaning, yes, ancient Egyptians were black people, quote-unquote black people, okay? Period, period, okay? I went to the museum at the National Science Academy in Los Angeles and saw the ancient statutes of the actual ancient Egyptians. They were people of color, okay? I'm not saying that they were whatever color, but they were people of color, okay? Now I say that to say this, the Bible tells you that when Joseph and his brothers and his dad came into ancient Egypt, they were 70 something souls. 400 years later, when they are delivered by the hand of the almighty God, they were a nation, okay? Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. 
how do you explain that population growth without some intermingling with those African people? So if they weren't colored in some sense before they came into Egypt, they definitely were a people of color. It, maybe not all of them, but there was definitely large numbers of them that looked a little something like me once they got out of ancient Egypt, okay? And how do we know this? When you look at what God said to Moses, Moses says, God, the people are not going to believe me, right? How am I going to prove to them that you sent me and that I'm not making this story up about the deliverance, about your desire to deliver the people? What do you do? He says, stick your hand in thy bosom. Put that thing out. What does it say? Leprous. Why that snow? You have to understand there's two types of leprosies in the Bible. The natural logic of that miracle says that the darker the natural pigmentation of Moses' flesh, the more powerful that miracle becomes. So I, I understood these things. And when you look at their depictions, they show no people of color in any of the uh, of any uh, in, in any of the depictions of any of the ancient Hebrews, okay? That was the first thing that kind of threw me off. And a lot of times they show them rather white looking. When they show you the angels, when they show you God, they always had this Caucasian look. This, I mean, anything but a black look. Even though the Bible is telling you something a little bit different. I'm not saying that you should only show them like black people and all the Hebrews was black and Jesus was black and everybody was black. I'm not saying all of that. But you cannot deny, you cannot factually deny the fact that most likely there were some black Hebrew Israelites. I mean, and this is, this is, this is with the most liberal mindset, not, not liberal, but this is, with the, uh, this is with the most pessimistic mindset, okay? You have to say, yeah, there probably were some black Hebrews, okay? So even with that most pessimistic mindset, okay, why don't you show this? The truth matters. The truth matters. Okay, and then when you show them only a certain way, when you show them looking only a certain way, what does that tell black people? I'm just saying. So I felt like, I felt kind of uh, pushed into a corner, so to speak, when I saw this, especially having a child that I'm trying to teach now and teaching her these things became important to me. Okay, so that was that first part. The second thing, and, and, and what that led to was research. I began to research. And this is the thing about it. I, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that you should not research in, in publications or in books, literature that is outside their network of information, right? But the Bible, the, the, the Bible, okay, did not originate in your network. The stories of the Old Testament, the, the, whole, the, the whole religion that you believe in, that they believe in, did not originate in their network. Okay? And the thing about it is, is that not all truth, in other words, when I learned how to speak and write and read, I didn't learn that in the network of the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? When I learned that uh, you know, two plus two is four and the square root of 12 is 144, all these things. When I started to learn like life, things like that, the Jehovah's Witness Network didn't teach me that. So now why is it that when we start talking about God, oh, well, you can only get it from our network. You know, don't listen to too much information out there. Like why? Why would I not consider it? And, and the thing is, I can understand if someone says, well, there's dangerous information out there. But here's the key. Here's the thing. If someone tells me that the true God is Zeus and that, uh, you know, the, the Anunnaki did this and did that. Listen, I, I'm not going to believe it. OK, there is no such thing as God and this and that. Like, I'm not. You can't like it doesn't hurt my faith to hear other people give their stories and what they believe. It doesn't hurt me. I'm not persuaded by things that are not true. OK, because I can differentiate the truth from a lie. OK. So, so I didn't do as they say. I didn't get, I did not only get information from their network. I went outside their network and I started to learn, okay? And what I began to see was a very obvious and very blatant push 
in the organization, okay, to manipulate certain portions of scripture so as to use it to favor their group, okay? So in other words, what I mean is that they will take prophecy, take literal scriptures, and transfer the meaning from what the scripture actually says to apply to their religious organization. And one of the things that they do this in, and it's in their own error, is around the subject of the children of Israel, okay? Let me explain. And for those of y'all who've been on my channel for a while, y'all know uh, what I believe concerning this. But it's not really what I believe, it's what the Bible teaches, okay? Romans 11, 1 and 2, and I've said this, and I'll say this. There's one place, one, in the entire New Testament that directly answers the question, directly answers the question, post-Christ, Post-Jesus, has God rejected the children of Israel as a people? That question is answered directly in only one place in the entire New Testament. That's in Romans 11, 1 and 2. Paul says, I ask then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Now, is that not directly what he, what I, what the question? He's asking the question because he's getting ready to give you the answer. The question is, can they, can they and can you accept the answer? Okay. The next thing he says is, by no means, never may that happen, meaning no. Then he goes on to say, for I too am an Israelite, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, the tribe of Judah, so on, so or no, the tribe of Benjamin, so on, and so forth. And then he says, God has not rejected his people whom he first recognized. Okay, so, and then he goes on to tell them that, listen, that, hey, that God has reserved a remnant until that day. And that a remnant will be saved. So I don't teach that, oh, all Israelites, and I don't believe that all Israelites are going to be saved by God. But the remnant, hey, hallelujah, praise God, shall be saved. That's what the Lord say. That's what the words say. I don't have to add or manipulate or change or switch up the scripture or manipulate the scripture to fit anything because the scripture is the truth. See, and again, this is the David versus Goliath battle. Goliath says, no, this is my scripture. This applies to me. You know what I'm saying? No, you're a liar. You're blaspheming. you uncircumcised heathen. You're blaspheming. I'm about to snap you with the sling today. <laughs> but what I'm, y'all understand what I'm saying though, okay? So, and this was just one such example, okay? You know what I'm saying? When, when you get into Joel, the third chapter, and this, this is, so this is what I'm saying. I began to see that their organization was teaching things wrong. That there were some things that I believed that were not scripturally accurate. Okay? Now, I worship God, right? And I'm raising my family. And I'm knocking on your door trying to convince you to come to be a Jehovah's Witness. Now, imagine the conflict that you would have in your heart knowing that you're trying to convert someone to worship a true God, a God of truth. But you don't, but you know some of the things that this, these people are teaching are wrong. How can you in good conscience go knock on another person's door? Look at him, his wife, his kids, his family and say, oh, come know Jehovah. Come know God. But hey, it's much more than coming to know God. Jehovah Witnesses don't want people to just know God. Huh. They want you to get baptized so they can call you a Jehovah's witness and that you can then duplicate more Jehovah's Witnesses. It's an organization. It's Goliath, I'm trying to tell y'all. And so I had this internal conflict in my heart because I knew that there were some things that this group was, that are teach, was teaching that were not true. Okay, and what really kind of like, kind of like took me to another level was, I, I don't know what year it was. It may have been 2005. I don't know exactly the year. I forgot. Okay, but there was a year where the this generation teaching changed and I was a Jehovah's Witness and I was on the fence. I was having this conflict when this change happened. And to me, when that change happened, it was confirmation from God that these people, listen, they fall into the category of a false prophet. Go look it up in the Bible. 
Go look up false prophet. What is the false prophet, okay, in the Bible? How would you know one is a false prophet? It's answered in the Bible. God tells you, not me. God tells you. This organization fell into that category, not only when that event happened, when they changed this generation, but many other times in the past. And the thing that really got me was they tried to spin it as if they received new light. Listen. People living in 1914 will live to see the end. At the time when the This Generation teaching was changed, it was about 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, somewhere in there. Okay, people who were alive in 1914, even if they was born in 1914, we're talking about 90 plus years old. Don't tell me that you changed this teaching because of some new light. Now, you, you, you're, you're taking me for a fool. Because, and not only are you trying to take me for a fool, you're trying to take everyone for a fool. And you're showing me that you're dishonest. Because the reason, the logical reason why you're changing it is because those the people who were alive in 1914 are about all dead. And if they all die, and ain't not one of them alive, in, in 20 years and God and, and the second coming of Christ don't come, what do that mean? Y'all understood. They understand what that means. That means that they are wrong as two left shoes. They just flat out wrong and they're flat out liars. So rather than take the risk of that happening, they changed it. They had to change it. It's not like, oh, new light. No. You had to change it. And if you didn't have to change it, you wouldn't have changed it. Don't say God came down and told you and then you finally listened that, oh, okay, this is what you need to do. No, it's a lie. They're liars. And when, I, and when I saw that with my own two eyes, with my own two eyes, I saw that. I couldn't deny. I knew. I, I knew. And that was confirmation that like, man, it's some other things going on here. And mind you, I didn't have, that, that wasn't my problem. 1914, this generation, I didn't have no problem with that. But it was wrong. Now, imagine if a Jehovah Witness in 1990 would have been like, you know what? Would have wanted to sit down with the elders and say, listen, you know, the Bible, Christ said no man knoweth the day or the hour. So, you know what, guys? I, I really think that we need to rethink this, this generation stuff because I understand we're trying to push people to make disciples and understand the urgency of the, that we're in the end times. But perhaps this isn't the right way to do it. What would have happened to that person if they wouldn't have backed down? Because you know the elders would have told that person, listen, this is what you're going to do. And if you ain't going to do this, Goliath again, if you ain't going to do this, you will be excommunicated. Matter of fact, you're going to be reprimanded today. Your privileges are now snatched from you. You have disobeyed God with your intelligence. Shame on you. And then <clears throat> turn it back on you. You know what I'm saying? Take your family and friends from you. The people that, man, come on. Y'all know how they get down. And this person would have actually been teaching the truth. And now 2005 come around and, oh, they, we, we, you know, they change it, right? To what this man was just talking about 20 years ago. Where is he at now? God knows where. Okay, he'd been excommunicated, y'all. They did whatever they did to him only to realize that this person was actually telling the truth the whole time. It's a cult, okay? So I saw all these things happen, and so this is what I did, okay? This is what I did. Because I still believed somewhere in my heart that perhaps God was trying to work with this organization, and maybe this wasn't all for naught. You know, it's the, the, the faith that you have, because uh, uh, your faith in God comes through this organization. That's how you're taught to think, right? So because I had that belief still, even though I knew the word was higher than an organization, okay, because God doesn't need an organization to complete his mission on earth, okay? So what I did was I sat down with a brother who I studied with to become baptized. This is a brother who knew me since I was yay high. I'm talking about knee high, okay? And I said, and I told him what I was going through and my issues and my problems with the teaching, with this teaching on the children of Israel. I showed him. Ezekiel 37, okay, which Jehovah's Witnesses miserably tried to explain 
in this new publication, Restoration of Pure Worship. Miserably ex tried to explain it. Doesn't even make sense, okay? I, I showed him Ezekiel 37. I showed him Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. I showed him Joel the third chapter. Joel the third chapter, the valley of Jehoshaphat. Y'all notice it's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, Armageddon, etc. God says he will judge the nations on account of what they've done to the children of Israel. You've sold a girl for wine. You've sold them to the Grecians. You've done this and that. Now God's judgment is on the earth. So how are, how are the children of Israel done away with permanently by God? But in the end, God is judging the nations on account of what they've done to them. And, and, and we believe, we teach that Joel, the third chapter, is talking about the second coming of Christ, but we don't believe this part of it. Why? I showed him that scripture. I showed him many other minor prophet scriptures, uh, books of Isaiah, the, the, the connection between the, 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 the way that the end times is talked about in Isaiah and the way that is talked about in Revelation and how they're actually the same event and they tell the same story about what God is going to do for the children of Israel. I showed him the 140 and 4,000. Listen to me when I tell you all this. Jehovah Witnesses believe the 144,000 is a literal number. This is how crazy this is. You believe, okay, understand that the 144,000 is, is the product of an equation, according to the Bible. So you believe in the literal number, 144,000, literally. But according to the Bible, what is the 144,000 a product of? How do you get there? 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that were listed. So how is it that you believe in the 144,000, literally the number, but you don't believe in what makes up the 144,000? So it's like me saying, well, yeah, I believe the, the square root or the, the uh, you know, uh, the, I, I believe that 12 times 12 is 144, but, but I don't believe in 12. I don't, I don't, the, the number 12 is insignificant. In fact, the number 12 doesn't even exist. This is, nah. But no, 144, yeah, absolutely. It don't make no sense, right? So, you know, I, I'm showing them all of these scriptures, showing them what the Bible says. And I even showed them that the Jehovah Witnesses, not until about the 1930s, they weren't teaching replacement theology, which they now teach, okay? They came out with publications, Salvation for the Jews in the early 1930s. That was specifically written for the children of Israel. Well, who they thought were the children of Israel, okay? The quote-unquote Jews, okay? The Jews. Understand that Herod was a Jew. Herod was the king of Judea at the time of Christ. Herod was a heathen. Herod was not no Israelite by blood. So when you get into these scriptures and these prophecies concerning the children of Israel, they're not talking about a group of people who converted to a religion. See, so what the Jehovah Witnesses did was they sent this literature out into the world, but, but who they sent it to couldn't receive it because it's not for them. You're targeting the wrong people, and you don't even know it. And so what the Jehovah Witnesses turned around to do, they saw the response they got, which was next to nothing because a religious Jew pretty much will not believe in Christ. That, that's just they don't mix, okay? A religious Jew, okay? I'm talking about the Jew that you believe that we see today, okay? That, that belief and their religion, when you research their religion and what the religion believes, it's totally incompatible with being a Christian and believing in Jesus Christ, okay? So when they did not, when the Jehovah Witnesses put this literature out and they got next to no response from these people, they, you know what they did? They changed their understanding. That is when they started to teach in replacement theology because they figured God must be done with these people. This must be, the, the, the chapter is closed. It's over, Right? Then they started doing what? They started manipulating Jesus' words. When Christ said it, uh, what do he say? Many times I've tried to come to you, but look, your house is abandoned to you. And all these other scriptures that they try to use and they manipulate, okay, to try to justify their teaching. But they're wrong. You see? They have to manipulate and twist scripture. And this is how you know. You know when somebody is reading scripture and something just don't feel right. You got like this feeling in the back of your, you know what I mean? Your neck itching, your neck here standing up. Somebody up there talking and they trying to interpret scripture and like your back is itching and you just get this weird feeling. Something's wrong. Don't think, don't just dismiss that in one ear out the X. No, something is wrong. The Holy Spirit is real. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I said, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? 
The Lord said that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the truth, reminding you and teaching you all things which he have already taught us. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? See, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't presumptuous. When I started having these second thoughts, I wasn't just like at their door doing all this and that. No, I, when I got these second thoughts, what did I do? I did what any person who is, any reasonable person would do, which is research, dig. And when I dug, I, I found that what I found. And so I brought the information to their attention. 30 minutes in, and this is where I'm at, okay? We had several elders meetings. And I'm going to give you guys a short version because this video is being long. I showed them all the scriptures. At the end of it, the, the highest ranking elder in our congregation, um, he tells me, and, I, and I, I kid you not, this is what he told me. He says, um, he says, you know what, Preston? He says, I can't tell you that you're wrong. I, I, he says, I'm not saying you're wrong in what you're believing and what you're saying to us and what the scriptures are showing us. We're, I'm not saying you're wrong. And this is what he told me. He said, but because the society, the, he says, the society teaches this. Okay. You're saying this and we're not saying you're wrong, but the society concerning this issue teaches this. This is their stance on this right now. So what you need to do is wait on Jehovah. And do, and my, by the way, don't talk to other Jehovah's Witnesses because this was the problem. I was talking to other Jehovah's Witnesses who I believe loved God, the God of truth and the Bible. I was talking to them. I couldn't keep my mouth closed about the truth, okay? And not even the whole black part, the whole black, it, it was, had nothing to do with that. It was, you know what I mean? It was, and it wasn't everybody. I wasn't going around, you know what I mean, doing all kind of extra stuff, but... You know, people was looking at me differently, but I was standing a little bit different. Like my, my eyes was probably lighting up a little differently about certain topics. And like, and I already had a certain voice in the way that I spoke. So people kind of, they knew who I was. I had a reputation in the congregation. So through, just through normal conversation, I would talk to people about this. And that's what the brother told me. He said, listen, because the, the society has this stance, you cannot teach. You cannot come over here and take this and talk to other Jehovah's Witnesses about it because the society is teaching something else. And when he said that to me, like, it broke my heart. Broke my heart. See, I was thinking it was going to be a roundtable discussion about the truth because I'm not going to come to your door teaching you no lies. I'm not going to come. I refuse to go to your door and talk to you about God knowing that I'm teaching you lies. I can't do that. See? Can't do that. So what, what was given to me was an ultimatum and I either had to stop talking about it or I, had to, or I was gonna be removed from the organization. And because of this ultimatum that was put before me, I am no longer a Jehovah's Witness. This is my story about how and why I am no longer a Jehovah's Witness. There's been a lot of negative things that have happened. Um, since then concerning like my relationship with like my family members and like my old friends who were Jehovah's Witnesses. Obviously I don't have their support and love the way I used to. I recall one occasion specifically with my grandmother who basically like was a strong part in raising me, asked me to leave her house. You know what I'm saying? And I wasn't even talking about religious topics. It was just my presence being there. You know what I mean? And like that was one of the hardest days of my life. Like there's been a lot of things and I can't even begin to explain to you the level of Betrayal that I feel because and the reason why I feel betrayed is because the very thing the, ver the very thing that gave me the pride to say I'm a Jehovah's Witness This is the truth That right there that part that gave me the pride and that very love for the truth and that very desire to teach the truth is the same thing and the same reason why I'm not a, no longer Jehovah's Witnesses and why I've lost those relationships. Goliath. Goliath didn't like it. He didn't like what I, what I did. So, this is where I'm at right now. Now, as I told the brothers there, I said, you know what? God was with me before. 
I ever walked into this building and when I leave, guess what? He gonna still be there. <laughs> Praise God, huh? The Bible tells you there's one mediator. How many? One mediator between God and man. And guess who he was? It's that man who went up on that stotos and died for our sins. Hmm. Worthy is the lamb, I'm trying to tell you today. So I recognized that I don't need, like you don't need me, okay, to, to get salvation and to make it into the kingdom. You understand? That I didn't need them. You know, y'all don't need them, okay? One mediator between God and Christ. Or excuse me, between God and man and his, and his Christ. You understand? So, um, yeah, that's the shortened version of, of, of how things happened. Um, I've written a letter to Bethel concerning this topic. I didn't get a response. It's been almost a year. I haven't got a response. And I started thinking about it like, man, I'm probably not going to get a response. I'm going to have to kind of fib and tell them something else. I know, or maybe not fib, but I'm going to have to like not tell them all the details in order for me to get a response from them. And even if I do, they probably won't want to get into this topic too much. And it's sad. It's, it's real sad. Uh, my desire is for those of us or those of you guys who are out there who are no longer Jehovah's Witnesses, like share your story, you know, like don't feel like you can't speak your story. You speak your peace and speak your truth. Speak it like people need to hear what's going on with this organization. People need to know um, the show just came out a couple of days ago. It was kind of putting them on blast, like showing the world what this group is is doing. You know how they cover up certain things. You know what I'm saying? And like it is what it is with them. Don't be afraid. You know what I'm saying? Because you matter. Your voice matters. You know, like, and at the end of the day, the most important thing for all of us to keep in mind is that, listen, you matter so much that the Son of God was willing to get up on that stake, that torture stake, that cross, whatever you want to call it, and die for you. Die and be strong and take on your sins that you couldn't carry yourself. Took all that away from you. All that shame that they try to put on you. All that guilt that they try to put on you. He already died for it. Now your job is to raise your voice. Be heard. Defeat this Goliath. Okay, because I'm going to tell you. What I've said to y'all tonight is the truth. I haven't lied about anything. And the truth will always prevail. Y'all have to understand that. The Bible tells you that God cannot lie. See, I haven't lost my faith. <laughs> if anything, my faith has gotten stronger. It's increased. It's increased. And I've reached new levels of faith that I didn't even know existed at the time. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful. Because you really don't have to have faith in God, really to be in an organization that claims to be the only true religion. And that's right where they want you. They don't really want you to have faith in God, okay? They want you to have faith in their organization, which is why when you get baptized, they say you are now recognized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is also the reason why there is no respectable way to leave that religion. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, not because of fornication, sexual immorality, lying, theft, whatever. No respectable way to leave. It's a cult. Anyways, guys, um, if you like this video, if you got some value out of it, share it, hit the like button, subscribe. Uh, check out my other videos, a couple other videos on this channel. Um, Raise your voice. Raise your voice. You know, it's interesting, and I'm going to say this, and I'm out of here for real. The Word tells you the story of David and Goliath, right? The Word tells you that once David took the head off of Goliath, the people who were once afraid, okay, of this beast, the, uh, Goliath, the bird tells you that they raised their voice and shouted and gave praise and glory to God. 
perhaps your story can inspire someone to raise their voice for truth, for righteousness, and for God. But it's not until you pick up that sword and slice the head off of that Goliath. And, 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 and I'm not saying like go do nothing crazy. I'm saying raise your voice and it will inspire others to do the same thing. Until we chat again, I'm out of here. Good night.